Hello everybody and welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2019 webinar series. With today, today's webinar is on pulse markets. My name is Claire Brown and I work with the Birchip Cropping Group and I work on the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitable opportunities. Now, before we start today's presentation, a little bit of housekeeping. We will take all questions after Paul's presentation. The Q&A window at the bottom of your screen allows you to ask questions. Click this button, type your question into the box and hit send. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to the question. This webinar is also being recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole thing, or if you have technical issues, or you would like to share this, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Now, let's get straight into today's presentation. I'd like to introduce you all to Paul Lange, the uh, Grower Services Manager at Centre State Exports based in Adelaide. So now over to you, Paul. Thank you, Claire. Um, thanks to GRDC and, and the Birch Cropping Group for the opportunity. Um, I'll look at a, a bit of an outlook snapshot on lentils, peas, beans, and mainly Kabuli chickpeas today, um, and go through a few other trade type um, requirements like currency and that pretty briefly. So uh, just a bit of background on Santa State Exports. So we're a South Australian um, owned and operated business. We've been we trade most grain um, through all of South Australia and Western Victoria. Um, been in the game for over 25 years and it is actually a family business where I work uh, with my two brothers as well as our business partner and his son. We're all within the business. Um, so getting straight into it, um, I will start with lentils. Um, this is a bit of a snapshot of production of recent times. Uh, I guess, Obviously, we're all pretty aware of where the, the lentil market's been over the last three or four years. Um, what I'll highlight here is you can see where my cursor is showing uh, in the middle part of this table was all about the production. You can see 14, 15 lower production, and then it exploded in 2016, and the volumes have held pretty well. Um, that uh, if you'll note here, those, those big prices, of which we'll show in a minute in 2016, they were further supported. Although if you have a look here, the world production went through the roof in 2016, yet with the Indian crop itself, it actually dropped in size. So that just threw fuel on a, re on a hot fire already. Um, and that's where we saw a huge, huge demand into India with, um, with the Indian government continuing to stockpile. A few other um, things of note, here though, if you flow through through to 2018, you'll note that world production dropped off again, yet if you have a look at that number that India is producing, that sort of reflects where the market is today, I guess, um, in the fact that we've seen, seen that huge production in India. Um, further to that, I'll just, a couple of notes um, here, places like America, look at the US in terms of production, where they've gone, um, and they've held their production pretty well. Obviously, 2016 was a big year for us in Australia also. Um, and the other one is interesting, which I'll we'll follow on with this shortly, but if you look at the numbers on others as such, which will include some of the ex-Soviet countries, their production has increased a lot. So, um, moving to the next screen and you'll See, I'm using Adelaide pricing. Please excuse that, but that's our backyard, so we know. But the idea of the price chart is it'll show you a trend of where we've we've gone and where how we've ended up. So again, um, you know, look at uh, look at the, well, really the chart tells the story. 14, 15 prices rose into 15, 16. We saw um, you know, a bit of a spike there. And then once we, the, uh, the Indian production was recognised and the demand was there, it held those higher prices. 
back to where we are now. The only thing of note, I'll, I'll put, and this is trying to show a bit of a positive light on things, uh, around harvest shortly thereafter, we did see some opportunities. So, um, you know, probably didn't get quite as high as, as the sort of mid 600s, but certainly got into the, into the high 500s. Now that was off the back of some speculation as to what the Indian government might do as a result of their, their election they had back in May. Um, speculative opportunities, but reality is the volumes really weren't there. It wasn't a huge, huge tonnage that would create those for those volumes. Um, so moving along, I guess um, after the boom, as I'll, I'll refer to it, uh, as I've previously pointed out, um, we did see new origins. So the US, albeit they've been growing lentils for a little while, um, their production exploded. Um, Ex-Soviet countries will call it the Kazakhstans and the like, they started producing lentils for the first time and, and exporting them. Um, Obviously, more traditional areas, like I pointed out, like ourselves and the Canadians and Indians have increased. Um, you know, the Aussie lentils predominantly will end up in Bangladesh and in Sri Lanka, um, but we've seen much more competition from the Canadians in the US as a result of the tariffs. Uh, and also, the Canadians have been pushed out of some of their other markets by um, the, the Black Sea lentils, for example, the Turks. They displaced about 150,000 tonne out of the Turkish market that the Canadians used to get. So um, that's just a supply. I guess I identify that the supply around the world increased dramatically um, through through that period. Um, one of the, one of the positives, which we'll go into in a bit, but we have seen the the Canadians and the Americans to resume exports to not to the levels that they were doing prior to the tariffs, but they're certainly moving rentals again. Uh, so the outlook um, for lentils is pretty written already, unfortunately. Um, Canadians are close to finish, around 80% done, if not more. The last part of their crop has suffered some weather conditions, so they will have some quality problems, but their, their crop size is going to be somewhere around average. Uh, obviously, Australia is going to have a smaller crop again this year. Abares sort of pegged it at around that 300,000 tonne, um, albeit that it's nice living weather but it's not ideal weather for for anything at the moment in terms of trying to, to, to grow lentils um, and so there is that concern that between frost and the dry conditions that those numbers could get smaller and quite dramatically um, in terms of the Indian crop so the monsoon this year was quite slow to start with um, but it has finished off quite well now that doesn't guarantee them the, their next crop at all um, but what it does mean though is, is that they will have the opportunity to plant it now, which will mean that there's no reason or no no pressure on the Indian government to necessarily go and change tariffs in the short term because their expectation or the hope will be to grow their own crop. Um, as I mentioned previously, we've seen the US and the Canadians resume um, some exporting into to India, although the tariffs are in place. And I guess for locally, we're still finding a lot of our customers are carrying lentils from last year, in some cases from two years ago. Albeit a crop being smaller here this year, we're still seeing a pretty solid supply. So my best advice for lentils at the moment for this coming harvest is, is, is there's a pretty similar scenario that we've seen for the last 12 months or so in that when the rallies do occur, then you know, I encourage you to, to keep chipping away marketing them because at this stage, you're probably expecting a pretty flat market for the next sort of six to 12 months. We'll move along to peas. Um, now, with a little more brief, uh, the, the peas and chickpeas, for that matter, is a pretty similar story to the lentils, really, in terms of where we've come from. Um, but again, looking at this middle part of this table, you can see 14 and 15 production down worldwide, a fairly reasonable bounce, obviously, in 16 and 17. Um, some of that production increase came from places like Russia, which, uh, you know, we've, we've seen that happen previously. They they can put on the tons pretty quickly. They'll, or mind you, they do jump out of them pretty quickly as well. Um, we, other than that, really the pea story is very similar to ours, to, to, the, to the lentil story. I guess the one thing we have noted that different uh, is, the, is the drop in exports on, on Aussie peas in the last, uh, well, since 2016 to 2018. Um, you know, exports out of, out of Australia dropped by about two thirds. 
to be honest, there's a couple of factors. One being the tariff, we all, or the sorry, I should say the quota for the field peas into India. But further than that, the, the domestic production um, and domestic demand has snapped them all up. Um, here's a bit of a picture for the pricing and how it's ended up. Uh, again, high pricing driven by international demand, production bounce, we're back to, to the lower levels. Uh, and then obviously from here on in, we've seen the domestic demand kick back into the picture again. And, uh, and post you know, harvest this year, really, um, the numbers really wouldn't make much up because the volume that was there, there's just so few peas being traded of late. Uh, moving along to the outlook, so I guess again, it's pretty similar to the lentil job as to where how we've got to where we are. Um, oh, the drought in Australia has seen a much smaller production uh, and a big, big percentage of it being consumed for domestic feed. Field peas are actually fairly well sought after. They're fairly versatile. They can be fed whole. They can be used in, in uh, feed rations as well. Um, but obviously, in that, you've got to compete with other protein sources. So, you know, up against something like lupins or soy meal, canola meal. Um, at, at this stage, there is no uh, indication um, that there's hope that the quota will be changed for importing into, uh, into India. Um, there's lots of reports of high pricing in India and obviously the rest of the world relatively low. Uh, the, there is actually, there's, there's been reports of smuggling of, of yellow peas through Bangladesh, I'm led to believe. Um, and in actual fact, uh, there was reports a few weeks ago of, of um, a shipment being taken by force by Indian border security. So there you go, smuggling of, of peas around the world. Um, the outlook again, you know, it's, it, it is gonna be pretty variable because the, uh, the condition of the crop here in Australia. Um, and as said previously, I really, I think our pricing here, albeit that we do, and we'll export some to other countries such as uh, Bangladesh, um, uh, but realistically, it's gonna be the domestic market that, that sets the price for us here. Um, so moving along, I'll change tack a little bit here. So beans, I'll tend to uh, concentrate more on, on the trade side of things rather than production. The reason for that is um, baby beans are hard to get the data for production individually. They're lumped in with dry edible beans, which can be broadies or kidney beans or the whole. So uh, what I tend to, to do here is I'll look at more so where our beans go. Um, and as you can see by this chart, um, Egypt's it for us really. Um, the, in blue, you can see how much each year for a number of years goes to Egypt of our crop. If you were to take the uh, UAE and the Saudi Arabia into that as well, you're looking at anywhere up to around 80% of our exports all go to that part of the world. Um, we are extremely important to them, but equally we are, they are important to us. One thing I will say um, is the feedback we get and we recognise in, in Egypt is the Aussie beans are as are similar to what they produce themselves in Egypt and are preferred and they do pay a premium for them. So it's an important market to us. It's a difficult market to work into at times, but it is an important one for our favour beans. Uh, likewise, just a snapshot of where Egypt's beans come from. Um, again, they, they, they do produce their own, not a huge volume, but they, they, traditionally uh, where they have produced so a lot of beans from has been France in orange. Um, you will note in 14, 15, 15, 16, the French dropped right off and to now being next to nothing going into Egypt. The reason for that is they've had restrictions put on the growers, I should say, have had restrictions put on by uh, insecticides and herbicides as to what they can use. Uh, big problems coming up with human consumption quality now due to mainly insect damage. French are still growing beans, but they're just not being able to get into Egypt for human consumption. Where the change has occurred in our market here, uh, sorry, internationally, has been the Baltic. So when I refer to the Baltic region, it's probably mainly Lithuania, Latvia, um, some from Poland as well. Um, you know, they produce a good quality bean relative to what, say, the UK or the French grow, uh, and they're a reasonable volume. In fact, if you ever look at the numbers, they've more or less just filled that French hole beautifully. Um, so they're probably one of our bigger competitors. The others, obviously the UK, as you can see in grey, they're consistent in what they offer generally volume wise. 
probably their variable tends to be more uh, about quality. End of the day, uh, if Europe have a big production and good quality, it reflects in poor demand for Aussie beans. Um, but if Europeans have a, a low production year or poor quality, then quite often we see solid demand for, for our beans. Um, again, we'll just look at a snapshot of pricing where we've been and uh, I guess um, where and how we ended up with such huge pricing last year were a combination of factors. We did have good demand into Egypt as an underlying factor, but we also had uh, local influences, um, real concern about how our crop was progressing. Uh, and, and to be honest, there's probably a bit of panic in, in some of the trade, um, just, just trying to buy whatever bean that was out there. As it turned out, our crop um, performed much better than expected. Uh, a lot of southern regions out really, really performed very well last year in terms of what they produced. As a result, you can see here, um, shortly after harvest, the, the market died pretty quickly. Um, um, and reality is though, there was very few left to be traded by the time we got that down, further down the track. But as you can see by this chart, last year's pricing was uh, off the charts, I guess. Um, so moving along to the outlook, um, as mentioned previously, the last year was a combination of factors. At this stage, Abair and Pulse Australia are sort of pegging the crop at uh, somewhere around the 300,000 tonne. Um, I guess off the back of last year and the fact that the increase in acreage for the beans this year have been in mostly the southern regions, which this, the southern part of our state and certainly in, into Victoria where the beans are grown, they're still sitting pretty good at this stage. Um, so that, that potential could be significantly higher, um, anywhere up to maybe 400,000 tonnes still. Uh, but obviously, again, the weather we're seeing at the moment is not conducive for that. So there's still a few balls in the air. Um, I guess if we do produce sort of that three to 400,000 tonne, the expectation is that we're going we're gonna to exceed what Egypt's going to require from us potentially. But if we're back in the price range that we're seeing today, um, Sort of in the fives, then we're going to we're going to definitely see some domestic take up of beans as well, which we didn't see any of last year given the, the pricing. Um, so I guess you know sitting here today, if uh, you know, historically anything with a five in front of it for favour beans is a good number, and if we can sort of hold those sort of levels going into harvest, we'll be we're pretty happy to be honest. I'll move along to chickpeas. Um, they, I haven't got the same level of data and, I'm, and I apologise for anyone listening in the north of the, the country that I won't really go into too much on desi chickpeas. To be honest, the desi is no different to the field pea or the lentil in terms of the market influences of late. Um, the kabuli, the small kabulis that we grow in the south, they certainly have the same, same influences. What we tend to find with our kabuli chickpeas we grow, the most commonly ones grown being small to medium size, is that um, they're hard to sell in an oversupplied market. And why, why that is, is because they don't fit into the Desi chickpea market or the Chana Dal or chickpea flower market, yet they're not big enough to hit those big premium markets either. So they tend to be in no man's land a little bit. Um, India traditionally do import some Australian Kabuli chickpeas, but they're generally net exporters as well. So, but again, quotas and tariffs have restricted that trade into India, which meant you know, of late, really, the bulk of our chickies have probably ended up in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, at this stage, you know, the chickpea crop, the Kabuli chickpea crop in the southern parts of Australia will certainly be a lot smaller than we've seen previously. Um, you know, certainly in South Australia, that'll be the case. But reality is, is we've still got plenty of clients that have got Kabuli chickpeas to find a home for from last year. So. Again, the outlook's a bit like the lentils, is if when the rallies arise, um, yeah, it's probably is when you should be should be jumping on them. One thing I will note is with something like the Kabuli chickpeas, I recommend that you stay in close contact and, and talk to your, your grain buyers because it's not something in this, we, we would necessarily have a price on each day of the week. So if you've got them, contact your, your buyers that you normally talk to, let them know that you've got them so that if the opportunity does arise, um, we know where to go find them. Um, so moving on along now, um, we've covered most of what we want to talk about with in terms of the, the, the grain specifically. 
a few of the other things in terms of trade. Uh, mentioned we want to talk about currency. Look, that's a really difficult one to, to talk about on any given day. Um, there's so many variables that can affect currency and not affect our markets. But currently, you've got Brexit, you've got the US and China having a little trade war, which, you know, um, in, domestically, we've got a, an economy that's sluggish, we'll say. We've got a reserve bank that's trying to stimulate the economy with the interest rates, yet you've got a federal government that's trying not to spend any money and find a surplus themselves. So it's a really quite difficult to, to sit here and try and predict what the currency might do. Um, and the other thing that is hard to explain is, is how a shift in currency affects our grain prices. It's not necessarily the dollar lower price should go up. It's relative to what are the cross rates, so other other countries that might, we might be competing with and what their, their currency, how that's been affected by the change, how the traders are affected by it. It's, it's really not as simple cut and dry as, as one goes down, one goes up. Um, general trade, look, there is, with all the you know, uncertainty, with, as I said, the US-China trade war and how and if there's a risk of us being caught in the crossfire on that one, uh, you know, the Chinese barley inquiry is, is, is a good example of that. Um, things like the, the tariffs and the quotas and a lot of the, in, the government intervention that we see, there's really so little we can do about those sorts of things. And, and to be honest, they don't help, but it's, it's, it's a part of international trade. Um, so really quite often, we just got to ride some of these things out because none of them ever last forever. The other point I will bring up quickly, and, and this is an important one and directed at farmers and, and advisors, is the, the importance of sticking to label rates. Um, we can't stress enough how, the, how that's, we need to protect our, our industry, our, our products, our, and our brand internationally. Um, well, as I mentioned previously, France is a very good example where the really just run out of options because the government's come down on them and restricted what they can use. And, and reality is the impact that has is huge. Um, we know we're near that obviously at this stage, but we really need to protect that. I mean, our, our quality is regarded to as best in the world. And I think it's important that we, we keep it that way. Um, so finally, the last little bit is about the relationship with your buyers and understanding and knowing who you're dealing with. Now, obviously, I won't, I, I'm, I'm stating the obvious to say that there's been some issues in, in Australia over the last 18 months with, with grain buyers and uh, are going, going through the hoop. Um, that just highlights the importance of knowing and understanding who, who you're dealing with. Um, and where a concern sort of comes in for us is if we go back to 2015-16, um, I can tell you now here at Centre State, we were getting anywhere up to 50 inquiries a day from unknown buyers that wanted to export to India or Bangladesh or Pakistan or wherever it might have been. Um, around that same time, we had a huge increase in farmers ringing us, wanting to know how they get their money out of, out of someone that's late paying, that, that they're really quite concerned about. Um, I guess from our point of view, I question if those companies, if they're showing, well, what happened was they showed some really high, strong prices to to the grower that was um, to attract the farmer, um, but then obviously dragged that payment at the other end. And, and I guess what I say to everyone that asks me is, why were they showing those such high prices in the first place? Because the reality is, is the names of those companies quite often are ones that we wouldn't deal with or, or, uh, or we don't know or, um, if we do deal with them, it's got pretty tight restrictions. So I guess my point is, is at the end of the day, um, know who your buyer is, understand how they work, build relationships with them. Um, we're very much here at Centre State about understanding who we're dealing with and, and think that's a very, very important part of, of how we trade. So at the end of the day, the highest price is not always the best price and that's what it comes back down to. So. Um, so that's pretty much me covered now for the main presentation. I'd just like to quickly say thanks to Pro Farmer and uh, to my brother who does our pulse trading and his colleagues that have helped put together some of this data. But um, I'm pretty much done with the presentation now. We want to open up to some questions. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, does anyone have any questions if you'd like to ask Paul one?
click the Q&A bot button and down at the bottom of your screen and type your question in there. Uh, okay. so we're holding to holding two seasons of lentils. Uh, well, I've got one for you, Paul. How about that? Yeah, go for it, please. Um, Paul, how are things shaping up for the pulse crops in South Australia this year? Um, so there's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, obviously, again, this weather that we're having now is not having a good impact, obviously. Uh, the lentil crop is variable, but I would say that there's very few areas in South Australia that have got a good lentil crop at this stage. Southern areas would, but generally in the north, it's pretty ordinary. Beans are still, there's a fair bit of hope out there for them because as I said, where they're typically grown is in pretty good nick. Um, the, the, the chickpeas, well, there's, there's going to be very few of them being grown this year, mainly as I said, because we've seen them being carried from previous years. Um, and I guess, uh, oh yeah, I don't know, I think it'll be very much about what happens in the next week or, or 10 days, Claire, because this weather's having a pretty big impact as we speak. Yeah, it is. It is warm weather, Paul. Um, we've got another one to just come in, Paul. Um, what, what, according to you, is the lentils old crop stocks in Australia? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't have that data in front of me right here, right now, and it's just, it's a difficult one to actually put your finger on, mainly because there's so many of them sitting on the farm. Um, the, well, it could be. Well, I'm not sure. If, actually, I'll have to have a look for you, Claire. I'm sorry. That's okay. We can take that question and uh, get back to. You. Uh, although that was an anonymous attendee. Well, um, I think, look, probably somewhere around fifty thousand ton is about a guess um, of stock that's hanging around. But as I said, a lot of it's sitting on farms, so it's difficult to, to gauge that. <sighs> Um, we're getting quite a few people coming in now. Thank you, everyone. Um, Paul, the Indonesian market for beans, it didn't feature on your graph, but I understand it is growing in importance. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, look, I did get it. I am a bit Egypt-centric on, on the, the bean side of things. It is, it is growing. It tends to be a container trade that we work into. Um, I guess, I, I said, I, I tend to get a little bit um, we'll concentrate on Egypt mainly because that, that seems to have been the most important market for us. Um, it is growing, uh, the, the Indonesian market, but we we ourselves in Centre State don't do a lot into that market. So I probably can't really expand too much more than that. Okay, thank you. I've got a question that's come in on the chat box on the right hand side. Um, how do you see comparisons of quality of pulses? peas, lentils, beans from WA versus SA slash Vic? Uh, so I don't do anything in WA, so I can't really talk about what their quality is over there. Um, uh, certainly find that quality is very important. Um, we can't underestimate, underestimate how important the quality is going into to places like Egypt on beans. Um, as I previously mentioned, the, the, the quality is king and they do love our beans. There, there is a premium for them. Um, and they do go to great lengths to protect that quality. So, so it, is, it is very, very important generally, the, the, the quality. Um, but as I said, I don't, I don't trade in WA, um, so I can't really comment on the quality difference between ours in South Australia and, and over there. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I am conscious that we are bang on 2.30 now. Paul, are you happy to take a couple more questions? Yeah, we'll just do a couple more, Claire, that's all right. A couple more, yes. Um, where do you see the current DCT market for new crop favours Del uh, October 19? Pretty similar to what we're seeing on grow bid levels at the moment. To be honest, there's nothing being traded. It's pretty difficult to sort of say where it last traded because nothing's really been happening of late, but um, sort of in the fives, basically, around, around that level. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
And another one, Paul, will buyers have a preference or pay premium for new season crop? So what we find it is a little bit dependent on the buyer. Um, we have some buyers ourselves that aren't so fussy about season um, and, and quite happily provided the, the quality parameters are met okay, then there's no discount as such. We do have other buyers though at times that do prefer to know what year they've come from. It's not so much of an issue if they're being stored on farm, but certainly, you know, when they've we've, we've gone they've gone into the system here in South Australia, we do some at times see a discount for old crop. Um, the, there are a lot being carried from previous years, so the the main there is you know we do expect um, old crop to be going into the new crop market to some degree, but yeah, there are times most certainly where we find that buyers are very specific about what season they're, they're after. Yeah, okay, excellent. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm conscious we might have to finish it up there. I do apologise for the last few questions that haven't been able to be answered, but I can put those people in touch with Paul and he might be able to follow up with you afterwards. Um, if you are looking for any further information on pulses, the GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring over the remainder of the spring to bring you the latest information. We also have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia for new pulse growers if anyone would like to come along. Uh, there are a number of crop walks in this project for the southern region for October. In South Australia at Mandala and Bull Lagoon, pulse crop walk October 11th. Victoria now, Curio on October 30th, and then Gimbowen uh, on November the 6th. If you have any other suggestions or requests for things that you'd like to learn about pulses, please let my colleague Prue know. Her email is prupru.cook at bcg.org.au. Once again, I'd like to thank you, uh, Paul, for giving up your time today for this webinar. Once you will leave the webinar, you will be redirected to a screen with a quick survey. It has five questions. It will take you no more than a minute just to see how you found today. If you're able to fill it out, that would be very much appreciated and will help us to continue to bring you post webinars. This is a monthly initiative, so the next one will be at the beginning of November. If you would like to be kept in the loop of these webinars as they occur, again, please contact my colleague Prue and she will email you when they are coming up. Thank you again very much everyone for attending and thank you, Paul.